Welcome to GRE. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold, talking today about another reason that rents are rising faster than historic norms and why that should continue. Then this week's guest is the biggest failure that I know. This means that you can learn a lot of real estate lessons here. We'll get a dose of mindset from him and learn about how he sees the climate of today's market today on Get Rich Education. You can get a 50-year-old house somewhere or buy a new one directly from the builder with tenant resilient amenities already built in. With over 3,000 Florida units at different construction stages, they are exclusively for investors. President Wagner in Alaska and team also invest strongly in their own product. That's belief. Start at buildtorentdirect.com. That's build the number two rentdirect.com or text 407-927-5074. Hey, is your IRA in a real estate syndication? Yikes, a 37% UBIT tax could hit you, but you still have a chance to set up your EQRP and avoid this. Did you make too much money in 2020 and need more deductions? Now federal law lets you set up an EQRP in 2021 and get deductions for last year. Yeah, retroactively. Even put old IRA and 401k money in Bitcoin, gold, or your own business. Get control of all of your retirement money, tax and penalty free. Text EQRP in all capital letters to 72000. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE from Ash to Beulah, Ohio to Ashland, Oregon, and across 188 nations worldwide. I'm Keith Weinhold. This is Get Rich Education. Last year, the price of building materials shot up, and as a result, housing values consequently shot up. And as a result of that, now rents are beginning to shoot up all at multiples faster than historic norms. Now that we're in the phase where rents are rising dramatically, let's look at another reason for this phenomenon. In fact, Zumper's latest national rent report will tell you that one-bedroom rents are up 9% and two-bedroom rents are up 11% year over year. And this is partly driven by the fact that American homeowner equity is at an all-time high. Now, if you're wondering what homeowner equity could possibly have to do with rents. See, when existing homeowners have all this equity and then they go shopping for a new home, it's quite a bit easier for them to outbid a first-time homebuyer in a bidding war. In fact, existing homeowners flush with all this equity. What they can do is afford to pay 20K more than asking price or even $100,000 more than the home's asking price. Think about where that puts the first time home buyer. How can they compete with that? A lot of times they can't. What this does is it gives that incumbent the advantage. So that's why these older people that tend to be your move up buyer, this incumbent homeowner, they keep pushing prices further out of reach for the first timer. And what does that do? Well, it makes the prospective first-time homebuyer a new renter instead, or it keeps existing renters as existing renters. They need to keep renting. So that incumbent move-up homebuyer that has this giant equity ocean wave they can place into that move-up home, well, that's something that the first-time homebuyer cannot swim against. They can't swim against that strong current, that equity wave from that move up home buyers. So therefore, that puts more demand on rents and more upward pressure on rent amounts. And hopefully you are enjoying that as a rental property owner. I have been enjoying rent increases in both my personal rental single family homes and my apartments. In fact, in my dozens of units owned, the eviction moratorium has not been much of a problem for me personally. Now, I did have a tenant where I lost 10 months of rent, but that wasn't related to the eviction moratorium. That was COVID related though. 
it had a twist to it. I think I explained it in depth on air before, where a truck ran into a single-family rental home. And it took so long to make repairs because the permitting office was closed in the pandemic, and then there were pandemic labor shortages as well. But insurance might still pay out on that 10 months of lost rent for that tenant. Now, I had another tenant that lost his trucking job due to the pandemic, but he moved out uncoerced. And I only had one month of lost rent there until another tenant came in. Now, in this phase, I am enjoying the rent increases lately. Just about every lease that expires, I'm getting rent increases of somewhere around 10% on average, sometimes more. And see, when you're leveraged, if you get a 10% rent increase, that might be a cash flow increase of 25% or more, depending on your leverage amount. I mean, 25%, that's the cash that you feel in your pocket every month. That really matters. So I hope that you are more the beneficiary of these pretty exceptional circumstances that we've had, oh, starting about a year and a half ago, rather than them being to your detriment. Hey, well, today's guest is very well one of the biggest business failures that I know about. But one soon learns that those people with the most failures are more likely to be the ultimate success stories. Most people aren't willing to make any big failure. So big failures, that should get some applause, really. It's like, hey, congratulations, you tried. And you know, this is something that I wish I would have realized earlier in life. Gosh, my mind often goes back to dating women. I mean, there have been times in my life where I had an attractive classmate or coworker where I almost felt intimidated by their charm and poise and beauty, so I never asked them out on a date. I just didn't think they'd be interested. And then later, I go find out that they actually were interested in me. Oh, I'll never get that opportunity back. I would have had less regret if I had just asked them on a date and failed, let alone succeeded. Oh, let's talk about success mindset with today's big failure. And then let's get his take on the temperature of the real estate market. He is Florida based in a passionate multifamily real estate investor. In fact, his 2008 global financial crisis related real estate failure is pretty interesting. It came tumbling down for him even though he had just a 30% loan-to-value ratio on his properties because he was not attentive to resident demographics. Let's meet today's guest. Being one of the country's top real estate business and peak performance luminaries, today's guest has a lot of great knowledge to share. He's built over 22 businesses successfully in 40 years, and some of them unsuccessfully too. So he really knows highs and lows of entrepreneurship. He remarkably recovered from losing $50 million in the 2008 real estate crash. He brings a lot of great insight in his approach to real estate and business and success in life. And besides conducting his seminars, Seminars, which he gets great attendance for. He really has a substantial following. He hosts a podcast. He's a best selling author. He's also a philanthropist that founded the Tiny Hand Foundation. Welcome back to GRE, Rod Cleef. Thanks for having me, Keith. It's great to see you, buddy. Great to see you again. It's been years. So let's have some fun today. Yeah, indeed. It's been a few years since you were here on this show. I remember you and your wife, me and my wife were in Italy at the same time a couple right. years ago, messaging each other back and forth. So oftentimes we're in this for the income, but you and I there were enjoying the outcome, the fruits Thank of you. our labor here in being active real estate investors. Rod, you are quite a mindset motivator in the space of real estate investing here. So really, what is the first thing that an aspiring real estate investor should focus on when they're just considering? and getting into real estate at all. I've given away several thousand copies of the book, Think and Grow Rich, which is something you should read several times a year. But the number one thing that Napoleon Hill starts with in that book is a burning desire. 
you've got to create a burning desire for yourself. So one of the first things we do at my boot camps is a goal setting workshop on steroids, I call it. Really, it's about an hour and 15 minutes. And I don't know if we'll have time for me to describe it today. But the bottom line is, if you don't know what it is you want and why you want it, how the heck are you ever going to get it? So you have to start there. Don't start with the real estate knowledge. Start with the burning, how to create that burning desire so that you push through fear, you push through limiting beliefs, or maybe you're comfortable in the comfort zone is a warm place, but we all know not a freaking thing grows there. So you've got to have that burning desire to push through those things. Indeed. It's truly a begin with the end in mind thing. Oftentimes Mm -hmm. that goal certainly goes beyond real estate, right? A person doesn't really want to own 300 doors just for the sake of owning 300 doors. Maybe they do want to, to touch on what I mentioned earlier, stroll the Venetian canals. Maybe that's part of their dream. Yeah. You've got to know what it is you want that's going to juice you to get you up out of bed early in the morning, to get you to stay up late, to work on Saturdays, to do really to grind for a few years like most people won't so you can live the rest of your life like most people can't. That's definitely the first piece of it. Then, of course, you've got to make a decision. You've got to commit. You've got to decide this is what you want. And I'm not talking about a dip your toe in the water thing. I'm talking about a total 100% commitment because if you're just interested and you dip your toe in the water, you're going to get knocked off track. If you're committed, you're going to be like a train on a track. When it's total commitment, it's no longer a dream. It's an outcome. It's got to happen. And so motivation will get you started. And that's the important, that's the first piece. You've got to have that burning desire, but that commitment's what's going to bring you home. I think for a lot of people, it's a start small, but think big sort of mindset. Is there anything specific to real estate though, Rod, that you would say helps someone crush it? Because real estate really is this maverick sort of thing where oftentimes people are misunderstood because a lot of people just think it's a myth to create income when you're actually young enough to enjoy it. What does someone do to really find the drive to crush it and kind of overcome society wanting to to drag you back to making maximum contributions to your 401k? (laughs) Sure. And uh, that's a really good question, actually, because you absolutely can crush it in any part of your life. I love that word, actually, because what causes that to happen? Again, it starts with the burning desire. It starts with that. You have to make a decision. You have to commit. The Latin root for the word decision means to cut off. If you're going to attack the island in battle, you're burning your ships because you're taking theirs home with you. That's a firm decision. That's But really, the bottom line is to be successful in anything, including real estate, you've got to do those things. You've got to commit. And then you've just got to take massive action. You know, you've got to push through fear. I remember, you know, when I immigrated this country, when I was six years old, I didn't speak English. I got thrown into school. I found out what bullies were. You know, I got beat up regularly, got chased home from school. And my mom, God bless her, thought it'd be a great idea to chase off the bullies with a fly swatter. So the next day you can imagine, you know, I got my butt kicked again. And I came up with this limiting belief that I wasn't good enough. Many, many people have these limiting beliefs that hold them back. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm not smart enough. I'm not analytical enough. But there's a reason that the acronym for belief systems is BS because 99% of them are just that BS. My first year in real estate, I made about eight grand. My second year, 10 grand. But my third year, I made over $100,000. And what I did was I started knocking on the doors of people that were in foreclosure. And I'm going to tell you that first door scared the you know what out of me. But you've got to take that first step. It's like Dr. Martin Luther King said, you take that first step in faith and the rest of the staircase will start to reveal itself. You can drive all the way across the country at night, only seeing 50 feet in front of you, but you know other people have made it. You know you'll make it. You may have some obstacles, but that's the belief that you've got to have. You know, I see it in real estate with the law of the first deal. I see it with my students all the time. I've been teaching now for three and a half years. My students now own almost 46,000 doors. I'm really proud of that. And I see it time and time again. That first deal takes them six months, eight months, even longer sometimes. Then they get it. And the next thing you know, they've got six of them. It's like they're dominoes after that. But that first one's the most stressful. It's the hardest, takes the longest. You've got to take that first step. So we should talk about that law of the first deal, Rod, because I think when someone does their first deal, they've at least moved their mindset enough away from this kind of conventional social conditioning that we all grown up in. And that really helps them push through that fear and take massive action. A few things dispel fear like massive action. So talk to us more about the law of the first deal and how that ends up being such a pivot point for new investors. The first deal is the hardest. It takes the longest. It's the most stressful. There's the most fear. And then when it's done, you're like, is that all there was? I mean, come (laughs) on. What was I worried about? Of course, it came together. It's just a dynamic that exists out there. And it kind of, again, ties into that first step analogy that 
It's the hardest. It takes the longest, but you've got to take it. Like Lao Tzu, the ancient Chinese philosopher said thousands of years ago, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. What I mean by that is you have to start. And this life is not a dress rehearsal, okay? We don't want any regrets. And some of you listening may fear failure. I'm going to tell you fear regret a lot worse than failure. There was a nurse in Australia, a hospice nurse named Bronnie Ware, and she took care of patients that were about to die. But she decided to ask him a question, Keith. And the question was, do you have any regrets? And she wrote a book about it. It's called The Five Regrets of Dying. You know what the number one regret was? It was not living the life I could have lived, living someone else's life, not doing what I know I'm capable of. Guys, those of you listening, especially those of you that are analytical, that could get caught paralysis by analysis, don't let that happen to you for God's sakes. You've got to take that first step and just start taking action because that action actually mitigates the fear. That's right. All these stories you hear about people lying on their deathbed, they don't often have regrets about what they did do and what they did try. It's always about what they didn't do and that fear of missing out. And unfortunately, when you're on your deathbed, that fear cannot be closed anymore. But yeah, this is not a dress rehearsal. This is your life. So part of that law of the first deal, I think, is figuring out that really learning isn't learning so much as learning is doing. And growth. It's so important that you're continually growing and progressing. We all think it's about the goals. You got to have the goals. That It's about how much you're growing and progressing. The goals are important. You need them. But I, I tell the story. I built this and I worked for this house on the beach for 20 years, an $8 million mansion on the beach that I built. And within two months of moving in, I was depressed. It's never about the goals. It's about who you're becoming. Happiness comes from progress and growth. And one of the things I teach at my boot camp is a planning process where you acknowledge that growth because, you know, you're going to have delays, you're going to have setbacks, but if you're acknowledging your growth, you're going to be happy. And so it's really more about who you become on the path to the goals that's relevant, Keith, as you know. And that law of the first deal, yes, you feel like you've gotten banged around a bit, say, if you're qualifying for a loan, just even for your first single family turnkey property or whatever it is. But after you're closed, after things have settled down, after you set up automatic payments with your mortgage lender, after you get that first cash flow check of $178, it's like, ta-da, I can't believe this showed up with almost none of my involvement for this month. And who wouldn't want more of that? So it's part of the law of the first deal. You really now understand now that you're inside it, and that would make you want to go ahead and multiply those efforts. But things aren't always a success. Sometimes people fail. Few people that I know in the real estate world, Rod, know more about failure than you. I mentioned earlier that you had lost $50 million in the 2008 crash. So when you're already doing something maverick to the rest of society, and then you fail, how does that feel? How do you possibly- well, let, 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 me, let, me, let me articulate it articulately. It sucks. Okay. It just does. And it's no fun. But the truth of it is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And of course, that was a massive growth thing for me. I call them seminars. You mentioned I built 22 businesses. I've actually built 24. 24 businesses I've built. Several were tens of millions of dollars. Most have been spectacular flaming seminars. Okay. But we fail our way to success, Keith. You know this. And those setbacks truly are feedback. You bring your knowledge, you bring your skill sets, you bring all of those things, all those experiences with you every time you have a seminar failure. So that's how I was able to come back from losing it to the success that I'm blessed to have today. I talk about that $8 million house I built on the beach. Well, I lost it in all the craziness. Now I live in this compound, but I've got two acres, big main house, two bedroom guest house, media building with a giant exercise facility, a, now a video studio, five cars worth of garages, storage. Anyway, I can go on and on. It's just a spectacular place, but because God's got a sense of humor, I can see my old house across the bay. The one I lost is literally right across the bay, oh, wow. out my backyard. I met the billionaire owner of Spanx, the lady, Sarah Blakely is her name. Yeah, beautiful human being. I met her at a mastermind that I went to, and I strongly believe in masterminds, by the way, and I have my own now. I've got, uh, I think, I'm pretty sure it's the largest multifamily mastermind out there. It's called the Multifamily Boardroom. We've got $14 billion in assets represented by the operators. But anyway, I digress. So I met Sarah at this mastermind, and she told me that her father used to ask her and her brother on a weekly basis, what have you failed at this week? And I thought, what an incredible question to ask your kids so they don't fear failure. So those of you listening, those of you that are analytical, you know who you are. Trust me, fear, regret more than failure. Again, I'm a poster child for that. It's really not a failure unless you give up, you don't get back up, or you don't get the lesson. 
That's the only time it's a failure. Otherwise, it's just a growth. It's part of growing. I mean, again, I lost 50 million and I'm back. I own thousands of apartments. I have this incredible home and all the stupid stuff, the cars and all that stuff again. That is a great question for one to ask themselves. What have you failed at this past week? And when you right. ask yourself better questions, you give better answers. But that's remarkable to come back from being down $50 million. I mean, that's almost like the Patriots being down 28 to three with two <laughs> minutes left in the third quarter type of comeback. A lot of people would just mail it in at that point. People killed themselves for losing less than the Great Depression. And even this 08 crash, there were people killing right. themselves for losing less proportionately. And and this is something that wouldn't hurt to talk about. Luckily, I was around a great group of people. I was in Tony Robbins' uh, mastermind, actually, another mastermind, the Platinum Partners. So I was around people that were thriving through that crash, people that were like, oh, come on, quit whining, just pick yourself up and go make it happen again. And so let's talk about Pierce for just a moment. Who you hang out with is who you become. You know this. And most people don't proactively choose their peers. They default to people they went to school with, people they work with. And I'm going to tell you, that can be a huge mistake because they can hold you back from their own fears, their own limiting beliefs, their, even their jealousy or their fear of losing you. And sometimes it's family. Love your family and love those people, but choose your peers proactively, the ones that you allow to influence you. And I know that helped me a lot. The second thing that really helped me was focus. Focus is power. What especially, you know, if you're listening to Keith right now, you're a leader. And right now, more than ever, the world needs leaders. And so it's so critical that you manage your focus. Because don't get me started on the fake news and crap on the media, because the media is not there to inform us, they're there to startle us and scare us and, and manipulate us, frankly. And so pay attention to that. Stand guard at your mind and bring in the good stuff. Go on YouTube, bring in the good stuff, the motivational clips, all the good stuff. Because again, right now the world needs leaders and you've got to be focused on what you want. Because whatever you focus on is going to get larger, both positive or negative. They asked Mother Teresa if she was anti-war. She said, no, I'm pro-peace. Kind of the same thing, but not really. It's focus, right? And so pay very, very close attention to your focus as well. That's so important, Rod, with what you mentioned about the support group when you had to come back from your eight-figure seminar, as you call it, the $50 million right. that you paid there. It might be okay for you, the listener or the viewer here, to have some friends that are coworkers, but you want to think about that a bit. If you're a workaday job sort of person and you're looking for financial freedom, how many of your coworkers do you really want to let get close to you? Because your coworkers were often, at least from your perspective, selected at random, and you can select your peer group with intention when you right. build a friendship, a mastermind group, right back to the old Jim Rohn, you are the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. It's truth. You show me your three closest friends, I'll show you who you are. Not just financially, your health, your happiness, everything. Now, can you love those people? Yes. You just cannot allow them to influence you. You really need to be around people that want more. You want to be around people that think what you think is hard is easy. So I started my mastermind. I had 16 people come to my compound here in Florida three years ago, about a billion in assets. And I was so blown away by the power of it. You know, Napoleon Hill talks about it in his book, Think and Grow Rich, The Power of the Mastermind. And I was so blown away by it, I decided to formalize it. And that's why I did it. Okay. You're listening okay. to the Mindset Motivation of Rod Cleef. More when we come back, I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. This is Get Rich Education. The people that our listeners can't stop talking about are Ridge Lending Group and MLS 42056. They've provided GRE listeners with more loans than anyone, and it's where I got my last few loans. They finance single-family income property up to four plexes. They're the number one lender for beginners and veterans. Start your pre-qualification, chat with President Shaley Ridge personally, and get your custom plan for expanding your cash-flowing portfolio. Start at RidgeLendingGroup.com. You know, a lot of investors choose either cash flow or home price appreciation, but one real estate market could provide both, Jacksonville, Florida. They've got 27% lower home prices and higher rents than the national median. Their market has appreciated 34% more than other comparable cash flow markets over the last 30 years. Get positive cash flow today and above average appreciation for tomorrow. They often have available inventory in Jacksonville, if you can believe that. Start at cashflowandgrowth.com. This is Peak Prosperity's Chris Martinson. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold and don't quit your daydream. Mm -hmm. 
Welcome back to Get Rich Education. We're talking with mega successful real estate investor and mindset mogul, Rod Khalif. Rod and I have been talking about what it takes for success achievement, specifically in real estate investing. But Rod, as an active real estate investor, of course, we've had substantial disruptions in the market since you were last here, ones that we never could have thought about. So why don't you lay out the real estate investor landscape for us these days through your eyes? This whole health business has has created a little bit of a hiccup on one or two of our C-class assets. It really was a blip on our A and B assets. But real estate goes through cycles, Keith. I've been through three of these downturns and the big one in the 80s. It's a season. And right now we have been in summer for a long time. I really believe we're in fall. And what comes after fall? Winter. And I think winter is coming. And you always think that it's going to last forever. When I lost everything in 2008, in 2006, my net worth went up $17 million and I thought it was going to last forever. But we all know it didn't. And it's going to happen here again. Now, will it be as bad as 08? Let's hope not. But I really believe a contraction is coming. And I've had some economists on my podcast that have predicted it's going to happen any day. And I really believe that we're due. I think we're frothing right now. Now, is that something to fear? No. Is it something to get ready for? I mean, I'm buying right now. I have a 296 unit deal under contract in San Antonio and it's a screaming deal. 10% cash on cash return, 15% IRR. It'll cash flow at 59% occupied day one. I mean, that's how good a deal it is. The point is I'm still buying right now because people ask me, well, if the crash is coming, should I be buying right now? I'm still buying. If the numbers make sense, why not? If I hadn't been hiding under a rock in 2009, I'd be on the back of my yacht enjoying this conversation with you right now, Keith. So (laughs) last time I got crushed by the wave, this time I'm going to surf that dang thing, okay? So listen, again, don't be fearful. There are opportunities everywhere, but when with crisis comes opportunity for sure. If it's a significant contraction, and it may just be a blip, who knows, but if it's a significant contraction, there will be incredible opportunity, but there's opportunity right now as well. I'll give you a funny story about one that I went through in Denver. Back in the late 80s, I had bought this house for 56,000 and I flipped it for 76. Not bad. The market crashed. I bought that same house back for 18,000. Okay, wow. same house. Several years later, I sold it for 160. It gentrified. This is painful to talk about this because I had 500 houses in Denver and I'd be netting about six, 700,000 a month right now if I hadn't sold them. I sold them to buy here in Florida. But anyway, we don't have regrets. We don't look backwards. But the point is that house now is worth eight or 900,000 because that area gentrified. That gives you an idea of what can happen in a real estate cycle up and down. just crazy swings. We've seen it in California over the years. We've seen it in Arizona and Florida here. I mean, when I crashed and burned in 2007, I was at a 30% loan to value. I only owed 30 cents on the dollar and I still crashed and burned. And I actually went upside down at by 09, I was upside down. It crashed more than 70% here in Florida. My inventory did. People say, why'd you crash? Well, let me explain. So I had 800 houses, two hours north of me, two hours south of me and everywhere in between. And I had some apartment complexes. It was the houses that pulled me down. The apartment complex has only pulled back about 11%. If I hadn't cross collateralized them with packages of houses, I'd still have them. Ah. But the houses pulled me down because it was just too spread out in my example. Can you make money from houses in a localized? Sure. In a localized market, you can if, if they're close. But see, if I had to send someone to fix a maintenance issue at one of my apartment complexes, everything's the same. And so they can stockpile parts and be in and out in an hour. Well, if they had to go to one of my houses, it's an hour and a half away. Then they'd have to see what's wrong, go find a Home Depot or a Lowe's. That could be another hour round trip to get parts. And then what took an hour at one of my apartment complexes took all day at one of my houses. And you multiply that times 800, these were C-class houses. So a lot more maintenance in that asset class, the caliber, you know, it killed me. And then the, the coup de grace for me was I didn't really check resident demographics back then. I didn't even really care. If you pay the rent, you can stay. Well, most of these residents I had were contractors, plumbers, electricians, drywallers, painters, roofers, and that fell off a cliff. That work fell off a cliff in 2008 and nine, so they didn't have work. So it was like the perfect storm. That's remarkable. I mean, we're talking in a few different senses about how you fell from a mountain back following the global financial crisis. We talked about the loss of $50 million. You had a 70% equity position in a bunch of those properties and yeah. still lost them, which is really remarkable when you're at 30% loan to value ratio. But yeah, it's interesting. When we Rod, deal in an asset class where you're paid so many different ways, like you are with real estate investing, you don't have the pressure of having to try to sell high and then buy low again because there is so 
many more things going on with it here. We're paid so many ways, which is, I think, a reason why maybe you are still buying, even if you feel that there are clouds on the horizon. It's all about cash flow. Going into a winter. Sure, yeah. sure. That's what keeps you afloat. It, it, That's it's what all about cash flow. Yeah. yeah it's, and, it, you know, I think it's interesting with what you brought up earlier, Rod. I think so many people revert to the recency bias, right? Prior to this health scare that we had, the United States had 10 plus years of nothing but economic expansion. A lot of people thought, what is possibly going to turn that around again? Maybe people are thinking that again because the real estate market has still floated pretty high through oh, the health on. scare like this. So, what clouds do you see on the horizon that might make us move yeah. from a fall into a winter with real estate investing, right? Who knows what the catalyst will be? This health thing, who knew that was going to happen, obviously, but who knows what the catalyst will be? But I will say this, and this is the positive in all this. So let me flip this for a minute. And that is inflation. There's no question. If you put trillions of dollars into an economy, you're going to have inflation and we're already seeing it. And the beautiful thing is that that's bad for everybody except us that own real estate. It's fantastic to own real estate if there's inflation because your rents increase and your mortgage just stays the same and decreases through payments. So I think you call it the triple crown if you want to define them. So we're in the catbird seat as it relates to hedge against inflation, but we are going to definitely see inflation. I think it's going to hurt a lot of people. And I think it's a shame, frankly, but we won't turn this into a political conversation. But the bottom line is what will cause an actual crash, an actual contraction? You know, our debt is at an all-time high. Uh, Personal debt is at an all-time high. Student loan debt is an all-time high. I think it could be a debt crisis, but I'm not a sage. I make mistakes all the time. In fact, I did a YouTube video. It's my highest watched video ever because negative news sells, which was titled the coming real estate crash of 2021. And of course, I don't think it's going to happen this year. So I'm wrong. There's a few months left. Yeah, we'll see. There's a few months left, but we'll see. But I know it's coming. It's like seasons in life. It's seasons in weather. It's absolutely coming. And so again, not something to fear, something to get ready for. Yeah, when we talk about inflation, like you touch on and how that's already reared its ugly head, we think about how, in a sense, that segments society between the investor that takes advantage of inflation and the consumer that has a harder time getting on top of inflation. As you touched on, I described the inflation triple crown that real estate investors benefit from. We benefit from the price inflation when we're leveraged, it debasing our debt. And then thirdly, how inflation enhances our cash flow because our rent income goes up fast while our biggest expense, our mortgage principal and interest is fixed. Over here on the consumer side though, Rod, more recently it's been stated that wages are not keeping up proportionally with this higher inflation. So I'm not too concerned about the health of the real estate investor at this time. I'm concerned about the health of my tenant and the tenant not being able to weather rent increases if the tenant's paying more for gasoline and used cars and food and everything else. So do you have any thoughts with all the properties you own about the health of your tenant at this time? Yeah. Well, I can tell you that I'm not buying any more C assets at this time, just because I think that demographic that rents a C asset, it certainly was the hardest hit with what just happened. But I believe that demographic is the most at risk as well. You're right. When I say health, I mean financial health. No, when I'm talking about the global health situation that happened during that time, the financial health of that demographic was the one that suffered the most. It was our, you know, it was my C assets that had the most deficiencies and they're the ones that needed the help not the A and B assets. So I'm in a flight for quality as it relates to the assets that I'm buying. The San Antonio deal I was talking about is a B asset. B minus, we're going to turn it into a B plus. I'm bullish on this country and bullish on real estate and love, live, eat and breathe multifamily real estate and love it with all my heart. And I do believe that we're going to see some things happening in the next year or two as far as a contraction, who knows the depth of it. But again, not something to fear, something to be prepared for. If you're thinking about learning this business, for God's sakes, come spend a couple of days with me, either my virtual or my live or both. Would love to see you there because uh, truly real estate is the most resilient asset class there is. And in like 2010 or 11, the rents had come back to pre-2006 levels. That's how fast it came back. And and it was even resilient through what we just went through with uh, the health thing. So I live, eat and breathe it and love it and uh, love teaching it and My students are over 46,000 doors that they own now, which just blows my mind. These are my coaching students, my warriors, I call them. And I'm so proud of that because uh, they're taking action and making things happen. Yeah, truly. So as far as actionable strategies for our followers, it sounds like you like to stay not so much in C-class assets, but B and even A-class assets if the numbers can still make sense. And then is there any particular market that you want to look for where wages can be more resilient in the face of higher inflation, whether that's parts of the nation or asset type or anything else, Rod? 
No, it's really more an asset type. It's really not parts of the nation so much. I'm looking at my U.S. map. I like the southern states. I really believe 80 million baby boomers getting old and getting cold. I think that was my line back in 2008. I was just a little early, but I really believe they're already impacting areas like Arizona and Florida. Florida is going crazy. Texas going crazy right now. So I think there's opportunity in the southern states. If you're thinking geographic, the question is geographic, but in the asset class question, I used to look for A, B, and C assets in A and B areas. Now I look for A and B assets in A and B areas. And so that's really where I'm at right now. Unless I can take a C asset to a B class by changing the demographic. I will do a C asset if I can change the demographic through my own repositioning and value add work, but improve the demographic to one that has more income. Yeah, well, it sounds like more of a flight to quality. Well, Rod, it's been great learning about and getting some actionable wisdom with the mindset things, as well as where we're at in the marketplace. If there's any last thing that a person would like to know and learning more from you, what's the best way for them to do that? Rod in Orlando, text that to 72345 to come join me at the boot camp. If you go to Real Estate with Raj, you'll get to my website. If you have any interest in coaching or or mentorship, like I said, I'm really proud of my students and it's incredible, incredible dynamic group of people, human beings. But uh, Real Estate with Rod is my website. That goes to my website, rodcleaf.com, but nobody can spell my name. So I go Real Estate with Rod. And my podcast, obviously, Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. We just broke 11 million downloads. So I'm really proud of that as well. And and. Thank you. But I appreciate you having me on, Keith. It's great to see you again. Please give my regards to your lovely wife. And I appreciate you having me on, buddy. Rod Khalif, it's been great. Thanks so much for coming back onto the show. Oh, yeah. A lot of energy from Rod today. And if you haven't figured it out by now, this episode is titled, This Guest is the Biggest Failure That I Know. Well, that's why he's ultimately such a success, and he's worth you listening to. Yeah, he wasn't afraid to fail, much like me and my past reluctance to ask the pretty girl to the dance, fearing rejection. So Rod is a winner. In fact, you've got to love his clarifying question today. I mean, just consider, if you regularly asked your spouse or your son or yourself what have you failed at this week? You're going to get some Rod Cleef like success at some point. Today, he likes investing in carefully bought real estate, but avoiding C-class assets and favoring better quality B-class, maybe even A-class assets. That means those nicer, newer assets that typically attract a better quality of tenant. Hey, have you ever wondered if getting your real estate license could help you land real estate deals? And what are the pros and cons of being licensed? Well, next week, it's an in-house chat as our own Andrea that runs operations here will tell us all about that. She is a real estate agent residing in Michigan. Until then, I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Thanks for being here, but you weren't here for me. You were here for you. Don't quit your day drink. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.